Hallelujah. Amen. Can you turn to Second uh, Kings chapter five? Second Kings chapter five. While you're doing that, so we thank you, Father. Second Kings chapter five. Put that a little closer. So we thank you, Father. We're grateful for just the things that are in your word. We're grateful for all that you've done for us. And those things that we lack, Father, we pray that you provide for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Second Kings chapter 5. You know, when we were, when I was a kid watching Superman, there was something that took away the power of Superman and it was kryptonite and so kryptonite took took the power out of out of uh, just stole the power out of out of superman and in uh, in the word of god in the word of god there's one thing that's kryptonite to the word of god does anybody know what kryptonite to the Word of God? Sin. Sin. Kryptonite to sin. The traditions of man. The traditions of man. Jesus said, you've taken the Word of God, and through your traditions, you've nullified. I was looking in my notes. I must not have written it down. But you basically, you nullify the Word of God through your traditions. So there was an instance where the people where the, the priests and the Pharisees had taken the law of God and the power of the law of God, and they had, through their traditions, had changed it so that it wasn't effective anymore. And the Word of God, the Bible says, is, is a, it's, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it's supposed to cut to our hearts and divide asunder even the joints and the marrow, and it's supposed to be alive. And through traditions, uh, the Word of God, the, the power and the effectiveness of the Word of God is taken out and it just becomes just words on a paper. And in the body of Christ, there, there are traditions, uh, even today, where we, the body of Christ, take the Word of God and then add stuff to it or take away stuff to it and, and through that through the traditions we we end up nullifying taking the power out of the word of god and we never want to do that as as disciples and christians of christ we we want the power of god active in our lives we desire it to become alive to us i desire it to become alive to me and so i always want to make sure that i am um just not looking at things through common sayings that we have in the church. We have common sayings in the church where, where they just kind of roll off your tongue. And, and you look at it and you say, now where does it say that in the Word of God? Hmm. But they just become common sayings that become part of our Christian culture. And we, we don't want to be ingrained in culture and tradition. <laughs> What we want to do is we want to be alive unto God and alive to Christ. And so, so we're going to look at uh, something in the Word of God today in 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. Now, Naaman, captain of the host... I'm reading from King James, by the way. So this is King James, if you guys are... I'm sorry, 2 Kings, I'm sorry. Um, I'm reading from King James, so if you guys are following along, uh, or if you have... The choices of different versions. Uh, that's that's where I'm going. It said, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because the Lord had given him a deliverance, uh, had given deliverance unto Syria. But he was also a mighty man. It says, He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she uh, said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord uh, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. So it's a bold claim by a little servant woman. 
she says to the wife of Naaman, uh, you know, if you, if, you, if you came to Israel, if you were in Israel, and you were able to... Oops, sorry about that. You know what? I'm just going to go with this. If you came to Israel and you saw the man of God, then he would heal you of your leprosy. Nothing like putting somebody else, uh, uh, you know, saying somebody else is going to do something. Uh, you know, if, hey, if you just went to see John, you know, if you went to see Scott, he'd, he'd fix your house for you. Chip, you know, if you went to see Chip, he'd do that plumbing job for you. He'd do a great job. Nothing like, like, like offering up somebody else's services for your need. Uh, but she does this in faith. She said, hey, there's a prophet in Israel. If, if Naaman were to go see this, uh, he'd be cured of his leprosy. So, so, of course, Naaman, you know, the wife tells Naaman, Naaman's like, oh, that's really cool. And verse 4, and one went in and told his Lord, saying, thus and thus said the maid uh, that is in the land of Israel, and the king of Syria, so this makes its way up to the king of Syria, said, go to, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, and six thousand pieces of gold, and ten changes of raiment, and brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now, when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant, to thee, that you may recover him of his leprosy. So they get a few things wrong in this letter. They, they, first of all, the women say, Go see the prophet. And so the king of Syria sends a letter to the king of Israel saying, hey, heal this guy of his leprosy, my mighty commander. Uh, and it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter, he rent his clothes and said, am I God to kill and to make alive that this man doth send me to recover a man of leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeks a quarrel against me. So the king of Israel thought this was some kind of guise, and he, he rends his clothes and says, you're just trying to pick a fight and start a war with me. And, uh, you know, this is the way that Syria is trying to uh, take over our country and take over our land. Now, the king of Israel at the time was a guy named Je Jehoram, the king of Israel. The king of Judah was Jehoshaphat. It was a divided kingdom at this point. If you read uh, maybe a chapter or two earlier, uh, Elisha, who is the prophet, has words with the king of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and Jehoram, king of, of uh, Israel. And he doesn't think very much of Jehoram, the king, but he's in the mix. So, so you have uh, a few things going on. You have Naaman, who's the commander of the Syrian army, coming to Jehoram, who's the king of Israel. King of Israel gets a little scared. And verse 8, And it was so when Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come to me. He'll know that there's a prophet in Israel. So we have this... Um, we have this thing that's going on. And, and so, so here you have the traditions of, the, of Israel where for someone to be healed of uh, leprosy, so you have a man with leprosy, and if you read in the law of God, it says that the way that someone's supposed to be healed of leprosy, there is a procedure. Bring the man to the priest, the priest does this, the priest does that. Uh, quarantines them for seven days, checks them again, see if things have changed. If that doesn't change, you do a few other things. And it's a pretty long and drawn out procedure to cure someone of leprosy. And it didn't seem tremendously effective. It was more just see if it's leprosy. And if it is, quarantine the person. And if it doesn't go away, quarantine them for a longer time, hang a sign around his neck. 
uh, <laughs> leper. When he goes through the town, he's got to shout, unclean, unclean. And, and so that was kind of the traditional way of dealing with leprosy was uh, quarantine. Quarantine the person. Uh, and uh, here, the king of Israel says, go see the prophet. Or he doesn't even say that. The prophet says, send them over to me. The prophet hears there's a problem. Send them over to me. We'll take care of the problem. So Naaman came, verse 9, uh, with his horse and his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elijah. And Elijah sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. So commander of the Syrian army shows up at Elijah's doorstep and Elijah won't even go out to greet him. He sends a messenger and he says go tell him to uh, to wash in the Jordan seven times and, and you'll be clean and Naaman verse 11 was wroth and said and he went away and he said behold I thought surely he would come out to me I thought he'd come out and talk with me and, and that he would, he would stand and call on the name of the Lord. He'd wave his hands over me. He would, you know, there'd be a little bit of a ceremony going on here. He'd strike his hands, you know, and, and the man of God would do this. And, and he was just incensed at this, uh, that, that this didn't happen. And, and um, the, the power... Elisha knew that the power wasn't in the man of God, but it was in the obedience to the command of God. That there was power not in the person, but power in the just obeying the command of God. And then he, he further says, you know, uh, verse 12, are not the Abana and Faithar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel. So he starts dishing on, I thought this guy would come out. And, and even the water in Syria is better than the Jordan. I mean, you know, maybe I could go here. Maybe I could do that. And one of his servants, uh, and he said, couldn't, couldn't I wash in them and be clean? So he turned away and went in a rage. And one of his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, would not you have done it? If he told you to go kill the Philistines and take a, a thousand scalps, wouldn't you have gone and done that? How much rather then when he said, wouldn't you have done it? How much rather then when he said to thee, wash and be clean? So he said, you know, all he said was go wash and be clean. So, so that broke the heart of Naaman, it broke his spirit, it broke his pride, and, and he went, he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came to him like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And interestingly enough, so when Naaman comes back to thank the man of God, then the man of God comes out, talks with them, they have a conversation. So it wasn't until he, he went to the river and just obeyed the word of God, then the man of God would uh, come out and, and talk with him. So it was the, uh, there was a, this was a spiritual work that was going on and a demonstration of the power, the supernatural power of God. Now God doesn't change. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. And so even back here, you had the traditions of the law and in the midst of the traditions of the law, God raises up a prophet who, through the word of God, says, go and wash and be clean. And the power of God is demonstrated, the supernatural power of God is demonstrated, and the prescribed methods of cleansing from leprosy were not employed. They didn't employ him in this case. It was just go and wash and be clean. We're not going to go through the rigmarole of, of do this, do that. And you read through, I, I read through Exodus 13 and 14. It's, it's complicated. It's this complex process that, um, like I said, I don't know that it worked how often it worked. 
There's, there's nothing in the scriptures that tells, that gives indication of, you know, a lot of people, have, you know, having this work for them. It was just prescriptive, do this, do this, do this, and, uh, and if it doesn't work, then you're, then you're unclean, and you've got to walk around saying you're unclean. But, so Elijah and, Elijah, Elijah and Elisha were two prophets that, that worked supernaturally in the power of God. And there was, Elijah was the first, and his follower Elisha said, I want a double portion of the Spirit. I want a double portion of the Spirit. And he was given that. And he became the man of God at that time. And he was, he was not, he didn't seem like a particularly soft and cuddly guy. He was pretty direct in his speech. He was pretty uh, direct in his activities. But he was the man of God. And when people needed the man of God, they knew who to go to. Because he was, he was the guy. Uh, the law may have been able to keep leprosy some, from spreading, but it, it couldn't cure. It couldn't cure. It could keep it from spreading, but it was the power of God that was able to cure it. Take it away. To totally cleanse. To totally wash away and cleanse. And I love the word, wash and be clean, was the word of God that Elijah said to, to Naaman. Just go wash and be clean. That's it. So, we're going to go to the New Testament. You could go to Luke chapter 3. Just wash and be clean. Luke chapter 3. We were reading this the other, the other day. Gretchen and I were talking about it, saying, what an unusual set of circumstances are going on here in Luke chapter 3. Just unusual set of circumstances. God does unusual things. God doesn't follow the norm. God doesn't follow the traditions of man. He does things that are different. Because he's God. He can do whatever he wants to do. Amen. First, uh, Luke chapter 3, verse 2. Annas and Caiaphas, being the high priests, uh, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. So John, he's the son of a priest. He's out in the wilderness. It says somewhere else, John's wearing a coat of camel hair, a leather girdle, and, and, and he's eating wild, he's eating locusts, he's eating bugs and honey. And he's, he, he doesn't fit the mold now, does he? He's not a, I saw the movie uh, where, uh, what is it, what movie was it, I forget. Is it The Passion of the Christ? Anyways, it's where the, it's where the, it might have been in the play Jesus. We saw that um, at Easter last year. It was it was from the, uh, the the theater that's down in Pennsylvania, Sight and Sound Theater. And all the priests are wearing these these getups with the, the hats and the beards and the this and the that. Think of John the Baptist, who's out in the wilderness <laughs> wearing a, a this getup, and he's and he's eating things, and he breaks the mold. He just breaks totally, and his and his father's one of the priests too. And he's living out in the wilderness. He's not even living in town. He's living out in the wilderness. And all came into the country about Jordan. And Oh, and he came into the country about Jordan preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. He's preaching, be baptized. Your sins are going to be forgiven. And I'm reading this saying, where in the world does he get this? That's not what the law says. The law doesn't... Where in the, what, was he making it up? The law said, if you want to have your first sins forgiven, you go get a, a lamb or this or whatever, and you kill the lamb, you slaughter it, you roast it, you do this, you do that. You know, you, you know, a lot of slaughter and a lot of blood. And here John is, he's out in the wilderness, saying, be baptized. For the washing away of your sins. And this was uh, different. And as it's written in the book of the words Isaiah, 
the prophet, verse 4, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, Make, path, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And he's preaching something new, and he's preaching something fresh, and people are coming to it because they sense the moving of God, and they're going out into the wilderness. And he said to the multitude, Verse 7, that came forth to be baptized. So generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He reminds me of Elijah. He's like, he's not pulling any punches. Hey, vipers, who warned you? Bring forth fruit that's meat for repentance. I'm not just going to, I'm not going to baptize you unless you show some fruit first. And that is just like the prophets. When they were speaking, they, they were like, you're full of sin, you need to change, you need to repent. I honor this person, but I'm not going to do it for you. And, and he, was, he had the spirit of a prophet on him. Bring forth, verse 8, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance. And begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham our father. I don't care about your traditions. Don't say within yourself, I've been a member of the family of God for 40 years. Uh, my father was, my father before him was, and uh, just being in the Gideon ministry, we talk, to, we talk to folks from down south, and there's a lot of that that goes on, not in this church, not in this church, other churches, but uh, I'm just... I'm teasing you a little bit. But there's a lot of that that goes on in the church, in the body of Christ, where people are Christians by tradition. They're not Christians because uh, they have a personal relationship with Christ. They're Christians because someone before them was a Christian, their forefathers were Christians. And John's saying, that ain't going to cut it. That's not going to cut it. It, doesn't, it didn't cut it back in Elijah's day. It didn't cut it in John's day. It doesn't cut it today. God doesn't change. God does not change. We have Abraham, our father. I say to you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. The people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and said unto them, he, he that has two coats, let him impart to him that has none. Let him that has meat, let him do likewise. Then, also, then came also the publicans and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed to you. And to the soldiers likewise he demanded of them, saying, and he said, "What?" Then they said, "What shall we do?" He said unto them, "Do violence to to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages." So he's just saying, "Repent, repent, bring forth fruit that's meat for repentance." And he says, and then he says other things that are that are the like. Uh, if you go down to verse twenty, twenty two. Um, Oh, in verse 15, he says, And all the people were in expectation. All men mused in their hearts for, of John, whether he was the Christ or not. Is, he the, is this the coming of the Savior? I think people felt this expectation. Is this the Savior that's coming? Is this the Son of God? And he said, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I comes the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable, and many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. But then to Herod he reproved him because of the, the thing with his... Uh, he, he, he took his brother, Philip, uh, his brother Philip's wife... Verse 21, And when all the people were baptized, it came to pass, Jesus came and was baptized, praying 
and heaven was opened, the Holy Spirit descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven saying, which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. I was reading in, in I'm not going to go there, I was reading in, um, in John chapter 1 that, because as I was reading this, I thought, maybe John got some coaching from Jesus. You know, they were first cousins, right? Their moms were pregnant at the same time, and, and they obviously knew each other as, as family members. And I'm thinking, where did John get this? You, you know, and then I thought, well, maybe it was the Son of God who, uh, you know, they got together on, you know, at, at synagogue uh, after time, and, you know, he's like, hey, you know, I'm the Son of God, you know. <laughs> Here, here's what I want you to do. You go do this and this and this, and, and uh, you know, we'll kind of work together on this, but you gotta, you got to announce my arrival beforehand, and then after you announce my arrival, then I'm going to come get baptized, and, and, and so I thought, maybe not to that degree, but I thought maybe there was a little collusion going on between them. But go to, actually, I want you to see this. Go to, go to John chapter 1 just for a second. I think it's good if you read it rather than have me read it. So John chapter 1 and verse 29. So John said, the next day John saw Jesus coming, verse 29, John chapter 1, 29, unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. And this is he whom I said after me comes a man who is preferred before me for he was before me, and I, and I knew him not. So John didn't know who Jesus was and what role he was going to play until this point in his ministry. He said, I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest. So I knew that God's Son was going to be made manifest. God had revealed that, at least that to, to, to John that he was going to be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bear record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, verse 33, but that he sent me to baptize with water. And the same said unto me. So God told John the Baptist, Go baptize with water. It was from God through the Holy Spirit who told John to do that. Go baptize with water. And when you see the Holy Spirit descending on someone, that's my son, that's the Savior. The same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Spirit, and I saw it, and I bear record of this, that this is the Son of God. So it wasn't until, even though they may have known each other, they weren't colluding, it was, the, it was, it, this was the work of God being done through the Holy Spirit, through, uh, through John the Baptist. So, uh, and Jesus even said, hey, among them that are born unto men, this is the greatest man that ever lived. Except for me, usually we don't think of John the Baptist as being like the greatest man that ever lived. But Jesus said, "This is the guy. It wasn't Moses. It wasn't uh, Abraham. It wasn't a it wasn't even Adam. It wasn't Isaac. It wasn't Jacob. It wasn't the prophets. It was John the Baptist." And that's quite, a, that's quite a big thing because there's not a lot written about him in the Word of God except for that he was the herald announcing the, uh, the coming of, of the Christ, the coming of the Savior. So, so if you could, I'd like you to turn to Luke chapter, chapter 1. I'd like to... I'd like to go through Luke chapter 1. So who is this young man, John? Who was he? He was the son of a, a priest. So the greatest man that ever lived except for Christ? Wow. 
obscure, obscure young guy. So uh, Zechariah, his dad's a priest. He's in the temple one day. He's doing some, some work. Angel speaks to him and says, hey, you're going to have a son. You're going to name him John. He says, really? And what sign shall I have? <laughs> he says, okay, I'm going to tell you what. You're going to be, you're going to be mute until the day he's born. So, uh, so, so here he is, this guy, can't say anything. And it's, it's, a, it's a different beginning. And, and, and so in verse, uh, you know, Elizabeth's full time, verse 57, was come. She was delivered. She, she had a son. Um, they asked him, what are you going to name the son? Verse 60, the mother said, not so, but thou, you're going to call him John? Don't call him Zachariah, call him John, right? We all know this. And so they, they made signs to the father. Father asked for a writing tablet. And his father writes, his name is John. And when he did that, his mouth was opened. Miraculous things started to happen. And his tongue was loosed, and he spake and praised God. In verse 65, fear came upon all those that were round. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit. His father's filled with the Holy Spirit. Prophesied, saying, Blessed be the God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of them that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, to remember his holy covenant, that he swear unto our father Abraham, that he would grant us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, we might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And he prophesies this great prophecy. And then he turns to his son and he says these words. And thou child. Now he's, he went from prophesying to prophesying over his son. And thou child shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. And what's his job? To give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. And thou, child, you're going to give knowledge of salvation unto the people through the remission or the forgiveness of their sins. So what did John the Baptist do? What did he do? He brought a message. Brought a message. Luke chapter 3. What did he do? Verse 8, he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Verse chapter 2, his father prophesies and says, you're going to give people knowledge of salvation. by the remission or the forgiveness of their sins, and then he starts doing. And he starts baptizing. It says it there. He's preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. What is John the Baptist known for? He's known for baptizing. It's in his name. <laughs> it's not John the prophet. He's not, even Jesus referred to him as John the Baptist. Jesus, when he said, hey, to his disciples, hey, what's John the Baptist up to these days? What's he saying? Oh, you know, he's going around baptizing people. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have heard it said for, and I'm not a Baptist. <laughs> I've heard it said many times. 
So many times. I went, to, I went to a church for many years. And I heard it from the pulpit. Baptism is an external sign of an inward conversion or something like that. Maybe it's not. Maybe there's a little more to it than that. Maybe there's a little more to it than that. And, you know, stay with me here. Because I was reading in Acts this morning, and I put little notes in Acts. I have this great thing called a... I have this great thing called a... Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible that you can, you can look up a word and see where it is in the Bible. Peter, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter gets filled with the Holy Ghost, preaches a sermon, and the people said, verse 37, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what should we do? Peter said, Accept the Lord Jesus Christ and confess Him as your Lord and Savior. No! Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 41, Then they were gladly received the word, then that they that gladly received the word were baptized. Acts chapter 8. Acts is the book of the Bible that divides words from the actions. It's the acts, right? Amen. This is the activity that the... And so when looking at the Word of God and trying to understand what Jesus said and what Paul said, the, many times by looking at what people did in the acts, you can determine what does it mean? Acts chapter 8, verse 12. But they that believe Philip's preaching... The, so now you got Philip. So you have Peter preaching, and people were baptized. Philip's preaching. Verse 12. The things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, and they were baptized both men and women. And then you got Philip with the eunuch. Chapter, verse 36. And they went on their way and came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? In verse 38, He commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and baptized him. Chapter 9. Paul, when he gets saved... And immediately, verse 18, there fell from his eyes, as it were, scales, and he received sight, and forthwith arose and was baptized. Acts chapter 10. Cornelius. Peter goes to Cornelius, preaches. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. What's the first thing he does? The first thing he does after they get filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they heard them speak with tongues, verse 46, and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Spirit as well as we? Paul, the apostle. Acts chapter 16. Lydia, seller of purple, verse 14. Acts 16, verse 14. And she was baptized in her household. Verse 33, same chapter. This is uh, uh, Paul and Silas. This is when the keeper of the prison, you know, they're let free, and the, the, you know, the keeper of the prison is about to fall on his sword. And you know, Paul, Paul says, hey, hold on. Paul and Silas say, hold on. Believe in the Lord, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, all that were in the house. He took them the same night, verse 33, washed their stripes, and they were baptized, he and all of his straight way. And there's other, you know, you just look up the word baptism. So let's go to... Um, Let's go to Acts 22.16. This is almost 
word for word identical. Almost Acts 22, 16, and this is what stuck out at me. Almost word for word identical to what was done in with Naaman. Wash and be clean. Just go down to the river. Wash and be clean. Wash and be clean. Paul is recounting Acts chapter 22 about how he got saved. Verse 8, verse 7, I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said, un and he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. Have you ever wondered what the name of the Lord is? Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecuted. Jesus is the Lord. Who, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you? I don't even know who you are. I am Jesus of Nazareth, who you persecute. He's recounting his, his, his time on the road to Damascus. And, and then he describes, verse 12, And Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came to me and stood, said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. The same hour I looked upon him, laid his hands on him, and he received his sight back. And he said, The God of the fathers, can you, this is Paul, years and years after he's been saved and he's, he's now in front of... Um, Who's he in? He's, in, he's in front of uh, the council, not the... He's in front of the king. Uh, and he's recounting before... I forget who he's recounting this to in front of. But this is, this is when, he's, when he's going to Rome. He's, I mean, this is years and years after he's been saved. He's, he's telling a story about, this is what happened to me. Ananias came to me and, and, and said, Receive your sight, verse 14, The God of our fathers has chosen you, that thou should know his will, and see the just one, and should hear the voices of his mouth. For thou shalt be a witness unto the, all men uh, of what thou hast seen and heard. And Ananias says to him, And why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Arise and be baptized. I mean, this is Paul who's telling the story, who wrote books of the Bible. This is not a, this is not a, um, uh, you know, some, some third-rate preacher saying this. Paul, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. And arise and Go dip. Wash and be clean. I don't understand all this. I admit to you, I don't understand all this. Why, did, why, why does God choose water and baptism? I don't understand it. I know what I've seen, though, in the, in the, in the church that I came to before I was here. There was a... There was, there was almost a... Well, once a year, we're going to have a baptismal service. And... And it was almost like this, yeah, it's over here. It's not really that important. And I just see in the Word of God that, you know, the, the, the most important guy besides Jesus who came to earth baptized people. That's what he did. And God and his Father prophesied saying, you're going to give people knowledge of how to be saved. And throughout the book of Acts, there is a um, there is a a focus on conf absolutely confessing, but confessing how confessing during this very it's a spiritual act, and you could say, well, it's a tradition. Well, uh, well there's one tradition that I think a lot of the church has gotten away from is, is uh, you know, baptism. And I think it's more than just a tradition. I, I was, we were reading about um, John the Baptist, and it, 
it just jumped out at me about who taught him to do this? Who taught John the Baptist to do this? God taught him. God showed him. Do this. And then the apostles, as they were um, going out and doing the work of, of God after they received the gift of the Holy Spirit, after they, the church was formed, that was the primary method of salvation and, and it's become very traditional and I believe that there's power in confession I believe that when a person confesses with their mouth and they believe in their heart they shall be saved but it's God's you know what did what did the servant say to the uh, uh, Naaman just arise just go be washed your leprosy is going to be cleansed from you. Just, just go do what God said. And I would encourage you that if you have not been baptized, if you have not been water baptized, maybe that's someone in here, uh, I would encourage you to do that. I would encourage you to become water baptized. And uh, I think there's more to it than... There, there's a lot to water baptism. I believe that it is, in, in the book of Romans, it talks about we're buried with him in baptism. It is, it is a, a, a point where you say to the world, it's, it should be done publicly. It's a point where you say to the world, I'm dead. I'm dead. Following Christ. This is, where, this is where the old life ends. This is where the new life begins. There are instances in the Bible like especially in, in, in Acts where, uh, you know, somebody, Paul says, hey, have you been baptized since you believed? They're like, well, not really sure we heard about that baptism thing. Or, yeah, we were just, we were baptized, but we weren't filled with the Holy Spirit. And so the, the order in which you do things, uh, I think there's enough provisions in the book of Acts. But everywhere in the book of Acts where people got saved, it was, it was linked with water baptism it was linked and if you don't believe it I would encourage you to go read and look and and take a look and and the traditions of the church aren't always right they're not always right the traditions and when I say the church I don't mean the the I mean the church in America doesn't always get things right. American Christianity, there are things that they don't quite get right. And, and the idea of coming to the altar, Billy Graham, bless his soul. I mean, that, that was... But if you look at some of the Korean churches, when, they, when people get saved, they got a big pool. And they got people going through there, and they're water baptizing people. And there's, there's more of an urgency in... Other places around the world where uh, where there is this link between water baptism and being and coming to Christ and having your sins washed away, having your sins washed away, arise, uh, be baptized and wash away. That's what that's what Ananias said to Paul, the Apostle Paul. Arise and have your sins washed away. Maybe there's more to water baptism than just an outward sign of something that's happening inward. Anyways, that's that's what that's what I that's what I saw in the scripture today. That's what I saw, and so praise God, praise God. Anyways, amen. We're gonna have communion. Yes.